2019, the International Diabetes Federation estimated that there were 463 million people who had diabetes worldwide. And they predict that by the year 2045, 700 million people will have diabetes. So there's a diabetic tsunami that's present. What about Canada? About 11 million individuals live with diabetes or prediabetes. We spent almost about $30 billion in 2020 managing this condition, and it's a growing health problem. Now, when we talk about diabetes, there are many different types. The two major ones are type 1 diabetes, maybe making up about 10% of the diabetic population, common in youth, and there's almost complete destruction of the beta cells, the cells that make insulin. The more common type is type 2 diabetes. It's the frequent type of diabetes, and it results from a genetic environmental interaction. In other words, it's nutritionally based. In other words, you eat too much, but there's also a genetic component. Now, even though these two diabetes, type 1 and type 2, are kind of different, they're common in that they both have diabetes complications. You have things like your eyes go bad, you have kidney disease, you have, uh, you know, uh, you lose sensation in your fingers and toes, you have a stroke, but the majority of people eventually who have morbidity and mortality is because of heart disease. Now, we are studying heart disease during diabetes. It's, the heart is a very interesting organ. It needs to continuously beat and pump 70, 60 to 70 beats a minute, and it has a high rate of metabolism. In other words, it requires energy for this constant beating. During diabetes, what the majority of people who have this diabetic heart disease basically have disease because their coronary blood vessels get blocked, atherosclerosis. So you don't have enough substrate or enough energy being provided to the heart muscle. What we are studying is that we are studying this heart morphology and function or heart failure in the absence of coronary artery disease. In other words, we feel that this heart disease is because of an intrinsic defect in the heart muscle. We think that the, the, you know, the funding from Diabetes Canada that allows us to, to, you know, to study this intrinsic heart uh, uh, you know, muscle defect, we think will be able to, the, the results that we get will be able to reduce the morbidity and mortality and healthcare cost associated with heart disease during diabetes. I thank you very much uh, for listening and thank you to Diabetes Canada for providing us funds to do this research. Hello, my lab has two principal diabetes research projects. Both are designed to improve our understanding of how the pancreatic beta cell works. The first is to try to identify why adult human beta cells aren't capable of regenerating. Several tissues in the body like muscle and liver have this capacity, but adult human beta cells don't. We believe this is genetically controlled and that we can use high throughput robotic technology to identify the genes that prevent human beta cells from replicating and regenerating after they've been damaged or lost. So far, we've identified three genes that when we silence them, we begin to see human beta cells replicating. We think that there will be several more to be found, and we have candidates that we're testing now. The end goal of this research is to identify the network of genes that control beta cell replication, such that we can develop drugs to get beta cells and people living with diabetes to replace themselves. This so-called regeneration approach would avoid the need for transplanting material and for immunosuppression. Importantly, the genes that we've identified are all very easily targeted by drugs. In fact, this gene family is the target of over one third of FDA approved drugs. So we anticipate that our findings will be readily translatable, meaning faster to the bedside. This work has been funded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and by the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. The second project in the lab involves trying to understand the role of mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell in beta cell function, specifically how the beta cell knows when and how to secrete insulin. 
this Diabetes Canada funded work looks at a protein called ROMO1, which we have found is a mitochondrial protein required for insulin secretion. Interestingly, in the mouse, we have found that ROMO1 is required for insulin secretion, but only in males. In aging humans, men, but not women, lose the capacity to secrete insulin effectively. Thus, this represents a useful model to study this problem. It turns out that females have a backup system where they can get around the requirement for ROMO1. So we're very excited to try to identify what the molecular basis for this sex difference is as small molecule drugs that promote ROMO1 activity or turn on the backup system in females will be beneficial for promoting insulin secretion in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I've been a pediatric nurse for over 25 years and my focus has always been on the promotion of wellness in children and their families. When I started to look into type 2 diabetes, I quickly realized that there was very little programming or work being done in this area in Saskatchewan. When I looked into the history of diabetes in children, I realized that it used to be considered an adult condition. In fact, it wasn't really until children started to go to doctor's offices with symptoms and complications of type 2 that it was really on the radar of health professionals. Uh, currently, there is a lot of attention now on type 2 diabetes in children and youth. However, the focus is primarily on what is type 2 diabetes, what is this disease in children, what are the complications, what are the treatments. Uh, and what I've learned here in Saskatchewan in particular is that there is an epidemic of type 2 diabetes in our Indigenous communities. So our team member has significant experience supporting type 2 interventions in First Nation Métis communities in Saskatchewan. This Diabetes Canada research builds on these community relationships and it's our intention to co-create hope interventions for Indigenous youth and their families here in Saskatchewan. Our team plans to actively engage two communities in Saskatchewan, one Métis, one Cree, throughout the research project process. The HOPE interventions will support First Nation Métis youth to learn about maintaining and protecting their health and wellness in ways that are directly linked to their culture, language, and ancestral teachings through meaningful connections with their culture and knowledge keepers. In doing so, Indigenous youth will build resilience and hope grounded in their cultural identity, leading to improved self-management, wellness, and quality of life. We believe our strength-based approach with hope as the foundation to the prevention of type 2 diabetes will be more meaningfully and respectfully aligned with the Indigenous worldview and promote self-care. Hope may be the vehicle to change with the goal to promote a person's capacity to make informed decisions. This research project will engage youth to protect their health, build resilience and hope, and positively impact their wellness outcomes. The rise in obesity in children is a major health issue. And uh, as a result, uh, the age at which type 2 diabetes occurs has been steadily decreasing over the last uh, few years. In particular, children who live with obesity when they undergo puberty have an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. Now, the reasons why pubertal obesity confers a uh, type 2 diabetes risk are unknown, essentially. Now, there are many hormonal changes that occur during puberty and that have a myriad of effects in addition to promoting sexual maturity. One of such changes is a decrease in the ability of insulin to promote energy storage, uh, what we call insulin resistance. And this transient insulin resistance is normally compensated for by an increased production of insulin by the pancreas. This increase in insulin production is in part due to the replication of the cells that produce insulin, the beta cells. But surprisingly, very little is known about how precisely the beta cells adapt to pubertal insulin resistance. So in this context, our research aims to discover these basic mechanisms underlying beta cell adaptation to puberty 
and to ascertain whether these are altered in an obese environment. We are conducting this project in preclinical models to really try and discover the fundamental basic mechanisms at the cellular and molecular level. We hope that this research project will provide detailed information as to how the pancreatic beta cell adapts to insulin resistance during puberty and how these mechanisms are altered in obesity. And although these studies are fundamental in nature and we must remain very prudent as to whether they will be applicable to humans, we do hope that eventually uh, these will help devise strategies to curb the alarming rise in type 2 diabetes in young adults.